Hey class, we're starting chapter three about ancient Egypt. And your book says from Narmer to Cleopatra. This is my subtitle that I gave it, Art in the Service of Religion. It's not in your book. It's because I think that this is a great way to think about the art of ancient Egypt because we'll see a lot of art that is made for their beliefs about the afterlife as well as kingly power. And it um, makes sense for a lot of their society as to why they made these grand and crazy objects that were the wonders of the ancient world. Egypt is one of the longest lasting and most powerful civilizations of, civilizations of the ancient world, and it's in northeastern Africa. It has a geographical relationship to the Near East, where we were talking before, so that's Egypt there. Pretty close. In proximity and um, it is actually was in was in overlap with the Assyrian art we talked about in the kingdom we talked about that there was overlap with other civilizations so just because it's a new chapter in the book doesn't mean that we're talking about a society that was completely different time zone okay or time frame than earlier chapters. In this case, some of the work overlaps with some of the, the time frames in chapter two is what I'm basically saying. Um, we're talking about mostly an era from about 3100 BC to 1200 BC, and this corresponds somewhat to the Uruk of the Assyrian, to the Assyrians in the last chapter. Okay. There isn't too much of a spatial distance between these kingdoms, so they definitely had contact with each other. This is an important slide to talk to you about Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. You'll see a lot of references to this in the artwork, and it's important to know that Lower Egypt is where the Nile goes into the Mediterranean Sea because it's the lower, lower part of the Nile River. It's actually north directionally, from Upper Egypt. So it's north of Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt's actually south because the Kingdom of Egypt was oriented around the Nile River and the source of the river and where it was flowing. So the Nile River flows from south to north. So that's part of why that terminology is a little bit confusing. The Egypt has been called the gift of the Nile because of the effect of the river. This is the delta, and it's a pretty old slide, and it goes through Cairo. It's a really, really large river. But it's been said to be the gift of the Nile, and it was coined by a philosopher, Herodotus, in the 5th century BC um, because of the way in which it created life and growth and all kinds of things in the midst of an area that would have been really, 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 and all around it is pretty much crazy deserts. Um, in ancient times, annual floods would create fertile farmland in the midst of what I would say is one of the driest pieces of land on the planet. So that's why it's been called the gift of the Nile. It makes sense. Um, it flows from the Great Lake Victoria, second largest freshwater lake in the world in Tanzania down to the Mediterranean Sea. So it's a pretty interesting river. Um, and definitely the river and geography and, ge and all the types of features of land are a huge part of why people live and settle in certain places. So that's kind of an overlap with other studies. This is another overlap, hieroglyphics. And there's a system of writing that we're getting in this chapter that was pretty, was used and formalized from really long ago in ancient Egypt, and it combined logographic, syllabic, and alphabetic elements. So it's pretty complex. Um, it has written characters that represent word or phrase, and then some that are like syllabic groupings of consonants, and then there's some letter sounds which are alphabetic. It had uh, like a thousand distinctive characters, which is crazy number if you think about our alphabet being 26. To try to remember a thousand different characters is crazy. The writing system was used into the 4th century AD 
but it was lost in the 5th century and became in, undecipherable. So there was all this writing on things, and they couldn't decipher it after the, after the 4th century, which is was a big problem for people who wanted to study ancient Egypt. And there was a man named Champignon, and Jean-Francois Champignon, a French scholar and philologist, so he was a language person. And this is kind of where we're talking about a different type of study language bearing uh, importance onto, you know, history, the study of history, and also art history, right? So there's an interaction between all these things. He is known primarily as the person who cracked the code, so to speak, of the decipher of Egyptian hieroglyphics, and he's a founding figure in the field of Egypt. Egyptology. He's a French guy, and during the 19th century, French culture experienced a period of what we call Egypt mania, and it was brought on by Napoleon's discovery in Egypt of different types of artifacts in his campaign there from 1797 to 1801, um, which also brought to light this famous stone called the Rosetta Stone. Now, you may have heard of like language learning programs called Rosetta Stone. They're based off of this actual object. It was a really important discovery and it's been in the British Museum since 1802 and is one of the most visited objects there. I've seen it in the British Museum in London. It is a granite stele, so upright slab of stone. It was found in 1799 and it has a decree on it that establishes the divine cult of a new ruler. Okay. It's inscribed with three different versions um, of text, and that's part of why it was used to crack the hieroglyphic code. Um, it was a decree issued at Memphis, Egypt in 196 BC about, it was during the Ptolemaic dynasty of King Ptolemy V. Ptolemaic. I always say that word wrong. But it's King Ptolemy V's dynasty, and it's about him being a divine ruler. Uh, that's a pretty bad slide, sorry. But that shows you that it's got different types of writing on it, okay? And the top and middle are ancient Egyptian using hieroglyphics, and then there's a Demotic script, and then at the bottom is ancient Greek. So this is hieroglyphics, Demotic script, ancient Greek. And so people... Um, were able to, he was able to crack the code, Champagnon, because of the different ones, because they could understand the ancient Greek. But the problem was figuring out how this related to that, because the, the language is not just a one-for-one -one, like an alphabet. They had to figure out how it all worked. There's an interesting documentary that I like a lot, and I show when we're in class, that I posted as a video about cracking the Rosetta Stone. It's a YouTube um, posting from History Channel. It's got its own page. So I'd like you to go watch that actually right now. Um, you can stop the video and come back to it. Or if you don't want to do that, do it anyway. <laughs> if you don't, then make sure you watch it um, because it's really interesting and it will give you more information about that. Okay, moving on into more of this culture and this land and giving you a little bit of overview of this whole chapter we're going to be talking about. So it's a chapter that deals with a really vast amount of time. And we're only we've only got like whatever 20 some odd 30 pages to read about it and some lecture to deal with 3000 plus years of history okay so obviously we're not going to be able to hit all the interest intricacies but in Mesopotamia kings mediated between the gods and people and later on eventually they were considered gods in ancient in ancient Egypt um, we're gonna look mostly at work from the old kingdom a little bit from the middle kingdom and then stuff from the new kingdom there were different things that happened like civil wars and things like that so 
but that's the kind of three main areas that we'll look at and have the most work that still exists. The early dynastic period when it first started happened because of an op a unification of upper and lower Egypt. They each had their own kings with their own types of crowns. And then eventually we're going to look at how this one first pharaoh united the two parts into one kingdom and you get this double crown out of it. So we'll talk more about that as we go. Basically, we have a guy who named Minis who in 3100 BC starts the dynastic period and he came from the south of the country, Upper Egypt, and invaded Lower Egypt, the, the Nile Delta area, and took over and became the first pharaoh of unified Egypt. Now let's talk a little bit about pharaohs. This is a picture, pictogram, illustration of a goddess whose name right there is Mott, right there. And she was considered to be a personification of divine order, truth, and conduct, and is the basis of how the pharaohs ruled. They ruled according to this principle, apparently. Okay, that's what they believed. Um, and it manifested in various things like the order of the universe and how it affected humans. But Mott could, their gods could um, appear in various versions of human-animal and human-animal combinations. And they usually have different symbols with them. They had a really pretty large pantheon of gods. So you'll see certain type of symbols. This is like one for her. And you'll see that they all hold the onk usually in a lot of illustrations. This is a version of one of their gods, Ra, the sun god. And so his, some of his symbolism is things like the big disc of the sun. He also has a hawk head, which looks a lot like Horus, but Horus has a king's crown on top of his head. So there's, this is kind of a, a really important god for them too, Ra. Um, so, and Horus is associated with the pharaohs. So we'll talk a bit about more and more as we go. You'll see various versions of these guys. But just know that they have these different gods, a whole pantheon of them, and that they look different ways and have different sort of symbols. And one of them that, a couple of them that we'll see a lot are Ra and Mott, and then we'll see quite a few others. Horus being one we see quite a lot, Isis, Osiris, and Anubis, because they're associated with um, embalming and mummification and things like that too. So there's a lot of gods, and they're all associated with particular things and skills and things like that or maybe like trades is what i mean by skills or principles of the universe okay from the third century third dynasty onward they thought that the sun god ra impregnated the queen with the sun so there's a few exceptions but pharaohs are mostly men and we get this idea that um they become like gods from the third dynasty onward and they're like intermediaries between the people and the rest of the gods. So this is sort of the guy, the sun disc head, staff of power, onk in his hand, eternal life. He's the one who impregnated the queen they believed. Okay, so that's an important part of, and we'll see some of the different pyramids and things, that that's an important part of how they made them. They were definitely polytheists like their niece, Near Eastern neighbors, and they didn't. It didn't bother them to add gods to their pantheon. They called this syncretism. They were okay with them having new ones come in and developing them, and that was, you know, that's particularly um, interesting because some like societies would not be okay with that, right? And we'll see later in the book, like ancient Romans were also pretty much okay with that too. So it kind of leads for a society that has some type of openness, but is also able to fold other things into it, not necessarily open fully, but able to take on things and make them their own. And we see some of that with the ancient Egyptian beliefs. So that's part of their sort of ethos. Horus was the son of 
Osiris and Isis in the middle. He's a sky god and he's identified with Pharaoh. He is the king of the underworld. Uh, he looks like a dead king, that's why he's green. And he has the crook and the flail of the um, Pharaoh. So you'll see a lot of twos on everything with the Pharaohs because it's upper and lower Egypt. Upper, lower Egypt, upper, lower Egypt. To a crook and a flail, a double crown. You'll see a lot of that. A papyrus and a lotus. She's the divine mother. So um, wife of Osiris and mother of Horus. She's the protector of um, coffins and one of the canopic jars and mummification. So we see her quite a lot. Jackal-headed god of the end there, Anubis, is the patron of embalmers and the god of the necropolis. So we see him quite a lot, necropolis being the city of the dead. And he's the god of mummification. And there's an important thing we'll talk about later, the ritual opening of the mouth, which is part of their belief in the afterlife. And so he's in most every tomb because he's, he's really important. A lot of these people we'll see inside the tombs and burials. So... This is kind of me just trying to give you a general idea of them and kind of what they might look like. So when you see them on the objects, when you see these symbols like the upper and lower Egypt, uh, crown, the individual ones, the different types of symbols that they're associated with, um, you'll kind of start to catch on to it pretty quickly. Oh, okay, that's what it's talking about. So next up, we're going to start um, talking about the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt and the certain object that talks a lot about it. So Lower Egypt kind of had a line right here from Memphis and then the Upper Egypt was all this area up here. Okay? So as I said in 3100 BC this started the dynasties under Menes, the first pharaoh and this is the Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt crowns that come about. And so we're going to be talking about how this unification, how they perceived it as a culture. And we're going to talk about a particular object and we're going to see some of the stylistic conventions on this object called the palette of Narmer. And stylistic conventions, we've already been talking about these. These are the ways in which cultures like to identify people, themselves, and symbols and things like that. If you remember in the ancient Near East, we talked about hierarchical scale, the frontal eye on the side of the head. Well, we're going to see some of these the same in this chapter, that they have some similar ones and they have different ones as well. There's this activity I often have people do when they're in class is to draw a version of themselves using this. Basically, it kind of shows you how there was an exact sort of canon of proportion, they would call it. Canon being their way that their proportions would be. Where the waist would be, where the eye would be, the fact that the eye is on the side, the, a profile head with a frontal eye, right? That's happening. Um, and then there's also something happening that's interesting, which is like a twisted, twisted, twisting of the body. Um, where we have a view of the person where their feet are in profile, right? And their head's in profile, but look, the torso is as if it's facing you directly. And that's like called a synthesized view, okay? It's very interesting. So we get what would basically be called a conceptual approach to the figure, right? And it's things like this, where, see how the feet are going sideways and the head is, but this eye is facing right at you, right? And then here, the torso is also facing at you. This is common. The feet are also usually like with a little space, and people often wear these type of kilts. And then they often have, depending on the figure, they'll have this sign for eternal life, different types of staffs and things like that, as, and symbols of them in particular. Some of the symbols they have of themselves in particular are also in hieroglyphs called cartouches, which we'll look at in a minute. So that's enough of the drawing exercise, and it gives you some of the idea of their approach to the figure. 
that the torso has a frontal view, that the legs are almost always apart, that the kneecaps are often stylized, and that they have a conceptual approach rather than a naturalistic approach. And then how their um, heads are shown in profile as well, and their eyes are frontal. Um, and their lower body is in profile. So it's this sort of interesting way of showing people that is obviously not like how people are. If you try to arrange yourself like this, you'll probably fall over because it's very difficult to do. But it shows a sort of idea of a person rather than as a person is. That's, the, that's what's important for them. So we're going to see this on the palette of Narmer, King Narmer, who's a first pharaoh. There's two sides of it that are called the Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt side um, because of the symbolism on each side. And it's called a palette because there's this little well right here, which you could, in theory, use to have eye makeup inside of and apply it. That's why that's what it's said to be able to be used for. But really, this object is more a symbol or an object that makes a claim about this historical moment. It's a narrative more than anything. I don't think it was necessarily made to be used, albeit it could have been used. It's really about an object. It's really an object that has to do with this narrative and telling this narrative. In this, we're going to see the idea that the narrative is shown from the view of the conqueror, um, and that it's pretty amazing that it survived for almost 5,000 years in perfect condition. It was discovered by a British archaeologist in 1897. Um, he also found with it the mace heads. These are maces and the heads of them. Uh, the Narmer one and the Scorpion one. So it's interesting how they buried with the palette some of the actual objects that are depicted. That's pretty interesting. Some of the earliest hieroglyphic inscriptions ever found are on here. And it's the oldest example of a fully developed version of these stylistic conventions that they found. Um, it's a historic record of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt under King Narmer. And I have different slides of it that kind of show parts of it better than others. So I kind of flip between them to show you things. On one side, the king is depicted with the bold white crown of Upper Egypt, the southern part of Egypt. On the other side, he's wearing the red crown, right there, of Lower Egypt. It's carved in low relief, and it's made out of a hard stone, slate, some say schist, um, depends on where you read it. I'm prone to think it's schist because it's pretty hard. Up at the very top is Hathor. She's the cow goddess of war up here. And some parts of it are the same on each side. So here she is on both sides. The same basic same top on both sides of it. And then in the middle there is also um, a hieroglyph that identifies Narmer. It's a catfish and a wedge or chisel between the cows. He is Narmer. So that's what that is, Narmer. That is the same on both sides. So it's obviously about him. In the middle register, we're going to look at just this one side first here. Before we go back and forth. I just First, I wanted to show you that it's the same on the top. And then the next parts of each of them are very different. So... We're going to talk about this side with the bold white crown first, okay? In the middle is Narmer, and he is in the smiting, killing pose. So he's in Upper Egypt crown. So this is a symbol of him killing his foe, right? He's got the mace that we talked about, and he's in this pose where he's holding his enemy by the hair, um, ready to take him out. And another symbol of Upper Egypt is the lotus. There's an interesting thing next to him is a priest right back here. 
You can't see it as well, so I'm going to show you this version of it that has an illustration that's drawn over it. So there's an armor, there's the mace, there's the priest, and he's so, shown to be a priest because he has this sort of tail sticking down right here. You can't see it super well, but it's there on the object, and it's right here. That's a symbol of him being a priest. If you see in his hands, right there, he's holding the shoes of the king. Okay? Now, you may have heard of this idea of um, taking off your shoes because you're on holy ground. Well, there's an idea here of going on that this victory, the killing, the smiting pose is, is the will of the gods. Okay? There's also here a symbol of Horus, who is the god of the pharaohs, helping him by kind of like drawing the breath out of his enemy. And this is that symbolism of the plant that's for Upper Egypt, right? Uh, the lotus. So he has the short skirt of the king, like the kilt, and he also has the tail on him that the priest has. So it kind of shows this beginning of the idea of kingly power as an intermediary between the gods and the people. And this is a an object that's very much about communicating that idea of kingly power and a narrative about um, divine power being being from divine power being granted to the king. So there's a unification of Egypt and also the idea that he is divinely appointed in an intermediary and in some way basically also divine. That's what it ends up leading to anyway later with the idea that the sun god Ra impregnates the queen. Okay. He's got the mace, which is another symbol of kingly power. And he has the false beard. It's not super easy to see, but it's right there as a king. We'll see a lot of those. And the god Horus is helping him conquer. So he is uh, doing this through the will of the gods. It's very interesting because the marsh is the river delta and so it's personified with that head right there. This Lower Egypt is that head with the um, papyrus out of his back, a symbol that is being conquered. And he's like holding its head, drawing its life breath out. So, Horus is. It's pretty, uh, pretty full of like a lot of symbols on here. And a lot of them saying basically the same type of thing. The very bottom register we have two foes who are either fallen like they're dead and we're looking at them from above, or they're fleeing, they're running away. And there's these symbols here that we're not quite sure what they mean, um, but they're thought to be maybe place names, um, two cities, a symbol of cities, not quite sure. So that takes us through this Upper Egypt side of the palette. It's a two-sided object, both are in relief. So let's look at the other side of it. Oh, that was a close-up, I forgot to show you, of the face. Um, and that is Horus. So you can kind of see that better there. Here is the lower Egypt side. Okay. So this side has got a, some different narratives happening that we're going to look at. At the top is the same part that we already looked at, right? We know that. And next down, we're going to look at these three registers or freezes. They have different things going on in them. And here's another version of it that's been drawn out next to it. So we have here a figure with the crown, right? We have all these different people with standards who are marching with them. And then we have these people who look like they're piled up without heads and heads between their legs. Okay? So let's talk about what's probably going on here. There is an idea of a walking victorious procession, and we have here a very clear idea of hierarchical scale because Narmer, we know he's Narmer because he has the crown, and this is saying it's Narmer's palette. 
is bigger than everyone else, right? So he's got the crown now of this part of Egypt. And on the other side, he had the other one. So this is the unification. He's got both crowns now. He's the biggest person there. And there's his, how do we know it's an armor also? There's his hieroglyph right there. Okay, same as up here next to him again. So they're making it very clear. He has the mace. He has the short kilt. He has the short beard. And he's got the servant still carrying his shoes. So a lot of the same type of things happening here. And now he's got people bearing standards and marching ahead of him. Led by a priest and followed by a sandal bearer and four flag bearers. Animals with um, dogs and falcons on top of them. Okay. At the end of the procession over here are dead figures. They have severed heads between their legs. And it's actually meant to be read from above. So all of this part right here. Is meant to be as if you're looking straight down on it, not from the side. So this is from the side, and this would be separate space looking down on it. So you're seeing all the people that they've um, killed. So shifting viewpoints, which is another characteristic of the scowl style we saw. They're not afraid to shift from the profile to the frontal view all in the same thing. Well, it's the same here. They're not afraid to look at something from the side and part of the... Um, object and then down look and then have you look down on it all at the same time. It's not not a problem for them. Above the dead is a hieroglyph which is about it identifies the seventh lower province of Egypt, a ship with a harpoon and falcon. So that's that up there. What's this here? What's going on in this register? That's interesting. It looks like a creature that you probably never seen on seen before it's not been on found on very many things it's very unique and it doesn't really have any known parallels and they're not really totally sure why they chose to do this but it's basically a lion or lioness with a giraffe neck um they're wondering if art historians and archaeologists wondering if it's some kind of symbol of kingship but we do know there's a pretty strong symbol of the two entwined necks being the idea of unification, upper and lower Egypt, right? And there is the idea of maybe taming animals here because these guys are holding on to them, holding their necks. So possibly the idea of taming Egypt by taming the animals. It's higher relief than the rest because it allows for this palette right here where the eye makeup would be able to go, so it has a little more relief, so it would actually be functional. So that's kind of an interesting and peculiar register in that we're not exactly sure about what it all means, but it seems fairly, some of it seems fairly clear, but it's not exactly, you know, known because these animals are, are not in other things. I wanted to show you a close-up of that crown and that that's Narmer's hieroglyph right there. You can see that stuff in detail. So this is the part we're talking about. They're called serpard serpoards. So entwined necks and the they make that recess right there for the now here is the last register we're going to talk about. It's got a bowl and somebody, and it may represent the king as a bull knocking down city walls. That's the idea that we're thinking it might be. And you can see an illustration of it there a little bit better. And this is it on the actual object. So they're thinking just like the Near East, bulls are symbols of power and virility. And in this case, kingship also possibly. And that the king... You know, he had a tail on on the other side in the procession, so maybe this idea of him being an intermediary slash priest, um, knocking down the city walls, defeating a foe. He steps on his enemies and his horns tear down a city viewed from the top. Again, like this, you can see the wall and the city viewed from the top. And if we look back at that other side, he had that tail of a bull, like a priest. So we're thinking, okay, and that makes a lot of sense, but not totally sure about all of that. So it's kind of, you know, a little bit of a mystery, but that's the general idea of it.
So that takes us through Narmer's palette. Pretty interesting object. It has a lot, a lot of symbolism on it and is based on a historic event, but we could say it's very, 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 very political and strongly motivated to say kingly power is granted from the gods and this unifying and taming of Egypt was meant to be and those people who were destroyed uh, was blessed by the gods and was a holy act brought about by goddesses of war and this first pharaoh is meant to be in charge. Um, very strong messages here and very much about the vic victorious people writing the narrative. So that takes us through the Narmer palette. Um, pretty interesting object that's been around for a really long time and gives us some ideas about how they thought of themselves as people, right? To answer those big questions, they think of themselves as people who are closely connected to the gods and that their civilization is meant to be this way and that they have a pharaoh who is an intermediary and later becomes like a god to them. You know, um, where are they going? They believe to the afterlife because of this stuff. So it's, it's very much tied into their identity as a nation, but then individual identity as well. This makes it a pretty interesting object. We're going to finish the part one of this chapter right here, and I'm going to upload this video. So make sure you watch that documentary about Champignon and the cracking of the Rosetta Stone. Um, it's on its own page. After this, make sure you watch that as well. And I also have another documentary posted that's about the overview of ancient Egypt. It gives you a lot of ideas. It covers some of the same material that I do, but other things as well and I think it's good to hear a different perspective on that so go ahead and watch those things as well and then I'm going to keep on posting the next uh, couple of videos of the rest of the chapter should be two more parts all right take care guys I hope you're staying well out there